So you have bought some real estate in a neighborhood that, let's just say, has seen better days. You could build a house or fix one up that's already there. And for the most of you, probably renting or selling is probably the route you would take. But I want you to think bigger. I want you to think of the possible. Instead of a short-term profit, what if you could chart the course of a long-term self-sustaining ecosystem that all started with that one piece of real estate? My name is Dominic Lawson, and this is The Startup Life. Let's begin. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. You'll never have the sacred stone. <laughs> oh, this you crazy mother... Hey, Startup Nation. Do you enjoy the startup life? Now you can let the world know with gear from the show. Choose from the label yourself, make your own luck, and making money t-shirts to tell your story of your path of entrepreneurship. Click the link in the show notes to purchase. All right, Startup Nation. So I hope you're ready to receive some value today. So in today's episode, we're going to talk about how to buy the block. There's kind of this movement to buying, you know, uh, real estate in neighborhoods that have kind of seen better days. But far too often, we don't really hear what the next steps are after we buy the block, if you will. So I'm going to talk about, you know, a way forward to see what that looks like. In the first segment, we'll talk about ways to kind of get started in the real estate game. You don't want to miss that. In the second segment, we'll focus on how you can turn that neighborhood into a full-fledged thriving community. We'll talk about that a little bit. We'll take a break, and then after that, we'll focus on deterring crime. Unfortunately, in these neighborhoods where we're trying to buy the block, if you will, crime is an issue. So we're going to talk about ways to how neighbors can kind of band together to kind of deter crime in that regard. And lastly, Startup Nation, we'll focus on once we've kind of scaled and got the crime down a little bit, then we'll talk about how we can really scale and make a change in that community and what that will look in the future moving forward. So Startup Nation, I hope you're ready to receive great value today and let's take flight. Startup Nation, I will am the first to tell you I am not a real estate tycoon. That is not my space. But I want to kind of give you some starter points to kind of dip your toe into the real estate game. Now, if real estate is something that you're really interested in, I want to leave you with two resources that are in the show notes for you to check out. The first one is my good friend R.G. Brooks over at the uh, him and the good people at the Mind of Your Business podcast. I want you to check out episode 32, Changing the Game Through Ownership. He has really good content on really, you know, getting your getting your beak wet, if you will, into real estate. Also, my man Gerald Jones with and his people over the Buy Black podcast out there in Omaha, Nebraska, episode 28. He brings on a guest where he really dives into a new form or a new way of getting into real estate game. So check both of those episodes out if real estate is something that you're really interested in. And like I said, both of those shows, uh, the links to them are in the show notes for you, Startup Nation. But as far as my, you know, way to kind of get you in those starter points, let me see if I can help you out with that. The first thing that you may want to consider when you're trying to get into real estate are to buy REITs. REITs, it's an acronym for Real Estate Investment Trust. If you're like me and you and CNBC is your Bible and you follow uh, the market and everything uh, like that, you know, you are familiar with REITs. Basically, REITs is kind of like a mutual fund, but it only really uh, focuses on real estate. And so, in you know, and they're really you know focused on companies that dive into different types of real estate, where it be buildings, retail spaces, apartments, hotels, the whole nine yards. And they kind of pay really high dividends. Like I said, it's kind of like a mutual fund. It's somewhat safe in that regard, but at the same time, keep in mind you are investing. And I have to point out, Startup Nation. I am not 
a licensed broker. If you want to do any investing, you need to do your due diligence, you know, talk to your financial planner in that regard. So that way you can do your due diligence and make, you know, sound investments that's best for you. I have to get that disclosure because, like I said, I am not a registered or certified financial planner. It's one of those things where when we talk about REITs, you know, you don't need, really need like a regular income or very high amount to get into. It depends on uh, who you go with. You really just kind of just, uh, you know, open up a brokerage account and then you find whatever REITs you want to dive into. Many people have packaged different REITs uh, together to, to uh, you know, for many investors to kind of get into in that regard. And like anything else, you know, when it comes to investing, it really just matters on what type of you know risk you're willing to take. And like I said, that's something that you have to kind of talk with, have a talk with yourself, but also your financial planner to kind of figure that out. Uh, Startup Nation. Also, Startup Nation, there are some you know online real estate platforms that you can use, like uh, Prosper or Lending Club, which connect borrowers and investors together to ch- try to make those type of real estate investments. Usually, this opportunity is like people who are trying to you know finance projects through debt or equity or something in that regard. Now, I will say that this is one of those platforms where you need a little bit of cash, Startup Nation. You you need to be daddy or mama deep pockets to kind of go and this scenario but uh you know if, if you're in that you know that tax brackets <laughs> you know feel free to kind of think about and investigate that and do your due diligence as well also you know many people they do rental properties rental properties are one of those things where it's a continuous uh residual income for you you buy up the property pretty simple you buy up the property you fix it up and then you rent it out to a family or uh, a, a single person or some of that regards and so rental properties are really are you know a buzz and you know for people who want to have that residual type of income as well now if it's one of those things where you don't want to hold on to the property you, you know like i mentioned in the mo- opening monologue you could buy uh, buy a property fix it up and then sell it you know that's also very lucrative as well i've seen People, you know, do like the wholesale route. Uh, my friend Benjamin does this. A lot of good uh, friends of mine, they do this. It's legitimate, <laughs> of course. But, you know, um, but this is also a way for you to kind of get into that space. You know, it's otherwise known as like house flipping, if you will. And also you could, you know, if you want to just uh, not necessarily buy into a piece of real estate, but you kind of want to dip your toe into it. You know, if you already have a house or something like that, you can just rent out a room like, you know, Airbnb or something like kind of style situation. If that's something that you want to do, if you don't want to really just go all in on a piece of real estate uh, and startup nation, you know, how can you find these pieces of real estate? Some people go to Craigslist to find real estate. Uh, you can probably go to your county's land bank. I know Shelby County land bank here in Memphis, Tennessee is a, a wonderful resource to try to figure out what uh, pieces of land that's available to buy and purchase. Uh, and these things are usually acquired through tax sale or acquired through liens or wherever the case may be. So there, there's a number of different ways to kind of get your start into the real estate game. And those are just a few that really come to mind. So we've bought our piece of real estate and now we need to figure out how we want to really scale the community, right? So I think the first thing we need to do is kind of build camaraderie with our neighbors. So let's talk about that part to really turn our neighborhood into a thriving community. So some of the things that great neighborhoods do or that people in those neighborhoods do is that they do things together. They do things that forces each other to get to know each other. One of the things you can do is to have like some type of community event where there'd be a block party or you can have like a like a, you know, get to know your neighbor type of dinner or something along those lines. Those are great ways to build camaraderie and getting to know your neighbor as well. Or maybe you want to do some type of cause where you all rally behind it, like whether maybe you have like a, a cancer walk or maybe you have like a some type of fundraiser uh, in that regard. So th- that's also another way. I know some people do wine tastings at other people's parties. Uh, you can have like a music concert you know, where it's like a common, where there's like a common area. If you live in a cove or there's a community center around or something along those lines, those are excellent ways to build camaraderie 
as well. Another thing you do is build like a neighborhood directory where, you know, you, you go around your neighbors and you say, hey, you know, what's your name and email address or whatever the case may be. And you capture all this information and you put it into some type of Google form or document and you, you know, disperse it amongst those people who agreed to have their name in the directory. This allows for easy access to communicate to somebody, say, hey, you know, I saw somebody, you know, near, you know around your house the other day or hey, uh, you know, would you be willing to, you know, come over and have a beer with me and watch the game or something like that? Just one of those ways to kind of build that unit, you know, almost kind of like a familiar unit within your community, uh, Startup Nation. Also, you can build a community garden. It's a great way for you to, uh, you know, build camaraderie, uh, build that cohesiveness with your neighborhood where you're working towards something that you all can benefit from. You're working together in the garden and you can all benefit from the fruits and vegetables that you create there. That builds, like I said, this this sense of unity in that neighborhood. And that's really what you want to build, Startup Nation. You need to get to know your neighbors in order for you guys to kind of have this strong, tight-knit community because you know people will uh, take care of that community if you know one another. And also, if you have something like a community garden, uh, you know, uh, more than one person will be invested in that. And so other people, and if somebody were to try to do something to it, you'll have multiple people like, hey, what are you doing? That's not right. Or maybe you want to have like a, t a formal tool sharing program where let's say, you know, one person has a ladder, another person has, you know, you know, a, like a workbench or something like that. And you can, you know, share each other's tools. That's also building camaraderie amongst your neighbors. Also, if you have like a, a, a situation where you welcome new families into the home it's all decided that hey uh you know if somebody's new to the neighborhood we're going to all bring over baked goods or we're going to all bring over a dish or we're going to all uh you know have something communal uh at a at a universal spot to like welcome the new neighbors that's an excellent way to build camaraderie and also um, to welcome new neighbors into the neighborhood because you want to get more and more people invested and involved in your neighborhood you want to get more and more people to know that you know it's a great neighborhood to live in right and so these are just some of the building blocks to do that also you know and i know it sounds corny neighbor neighbor day is in april so on neighbor day have some type of festival have some type of event where you do something together maybe you want to start a neighborhood book club right you know that's also a great way to you know build that camaraderie i've been in neighborhoods where uh some people have like they have their mailbox right and they have like this other uh it's, it, it looks like a mailbox or it's shaped like a mailbox or you know depending on you know what your fancy is but what they do is they have like this it's basically like a, a neighborhood library where they have like these books in this in a like a outside bookcase and people just come by grab a book you know, and then you have to be done with it by the end of the month and bring the book back or whatever the case may be. And then the person comes back out and brings out another set of books for people in the neighborhood to enjoy. And it's all free. That's one of those very inviting ways to, to build that camaraderie. Now, I know there's going to be cynics out there like Dominic, nobody reads. OK, maybe so. But the point I'm trying to make is that you're you're trying to be inviting. You're trying to be approachable. And that's one of those things that's important in being a good neighbor. You're, you want people to let you know, like, hey, that person is a good person. Because nine times out of ten, if they have something outside of their house that's like a, a, a neighborhood bookshelf or a neighborhood library, nine times out of ten, they're, they're open and willing to do other stuff in that neighborhood. Because the thing is, they're reaching out with this olive branch to reach out to the neighborhood. So think about that, Startup Nation. Also, be willing to do things for your neighbor as well. If you're somewhere on the East Coast or somewhere you know up north where it snows a lot, be willing to shovel your neighbor's, neighbor's sidewalk. You know, in a neighborhood, a lot of times when you have like a HOA or you have city ordinances where you have to have your sidewalk shoveled, you know, like 24 hours after it snows or something like that. So like and, and some people can get fined. So let's say, you know, it snows, your neighbor is, you know, out of town or whatever, you know, and you don't want them to get fined. Go ahead and shovel that snow a little bit, right? Go ahead and, and, and help them out with a little bit, right? Because that builds camaraderie between you two. That lets that builds a sense of rapport with the two. It lets you know, it lets that neighbor know that you're looking out for them. One of the things that I do uh, with my neighbor, I have a great neighbor, by the way, uh, 
um, is that so where I live, we, we live in a cove. And so for some idiotic reason, yeah, I say idiotic. My HOA probably never hear this. So for some idiotic reason, we have a thing. Well, it's not an HOA thing. It's actually a city ordinance thing. So, But I'm pretty sure the city of South Haven will never hear this. But anyway, uh, we have this thing where uh, it is so stupid that you can't have a basketball goal in the street. Now, if it was like a like a you know a one of those through streets you know where like there's constant traffic everywhere I, I understand that but for some reason it applies to us in a cove on a technicality right because mind you if you live in a cove there's not a ton of traffic it's mostly just the people who live in that cove and it's not as much as like a regular street and so apparently you know my my neighbor has gotten fined or whatever the case may be for having his basketball goal up uh, for, you know, not just for his kids, you know, to use, but he allows like anybody's kids in, in the cold for to use, use as well. And so what I like to do is that when there's nobody playing on the basketball goal and, you know, his kids are inside, all the kids are inside, I'll put it down so that way he doesn't get fined. Because for some reason, if it's in his yard, it's okay. But if it's like on the street and it's just standing there and nobody's using it, then he gets fined. And so that's just one of the ways where, you know, you're building camaraderie with your neighbor. Another thing I do with my neighbor, like, so I have a tree in my front yard. And so when the leaves fall down, uh, you know, they sometimes blow into his yard. I go get those leaves out of his yard. They're my leaves. And he gets on me all the time like, Dominic, it's okay. Like, it, it's not that big a deal. But what, you know, I was trying, I'm trying to get him to understand, like, look, man, first of all, they're my leaves. So I feel like they're my responsibility. But also, it's one of those things where it's like, I'm, I'm building a rapport. I'm building a camaraderie with my neighbors. So that way, if, you know, something comes up or along the lines where I may need his help with something, it won't be an issue because I've always been there for him. So I'll, I'll receive that reciprocity. Not that you want to do it for reciprocity's sake, but you're doing it to build a neighborhood. You're doing it to build camaraderie. You're doing it to get to know your neighbor. So that way, the neighborhood as a whole flourishes together. Another thing that happens in good neighborhoods is that they support the neighborhood school okay so this is along the lines of like you know because well i mean let's be honest you know i mean if you're if you have if you live in the neighborhood and you have kids you go to the neighborhood school so you want to interact with that school you want to put like the school's you know what's that a yard signs in the yard to support whatever current fundraiser or to start a fundraiser or whatever the case may be because all pillars are a pillar of a good neighborhood is a very good school. And so you want to feed into that school to make sure that it thrives, to make sure that it works. Because, you know, another thing that schools do, believe it or not, is deter crime. So if you have a good school and you have a good neighborhood, they are, you know, they are, uh, you know, they work together in order to improve the neighborhood together. So you want to be mindful of that. Support the neighborhood school, support its, its fundraisers, their, their, their sports teams. You know the 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 teachers and the administrations there. Look, if you're in a neighborhood and you know you maybe you don't have kids, but if you just go and just drop off like a truckload of pencils or paper uh, at a school, I can't tell you how much of a hero you will be at that school. You, I swear, they'll put a crown on you the minute you step on campus because that's one of those things where you know a lot of schools need. They go through a lot of supplies. They go through a lot of copy paper. They go through a lot of paint, crayons, glue. Whatever you can think a school may need, right? So if you show up with a truckload of supplies, man, you'll be king or queen for a day at that school. And that's and that school will always remember that. And they will and that school will pour back into not only you, but the neighborhood as well. Another thing, Startup Nation, is you know, if there's an issue with a neighbor or something like that, address those those issues, you know, directly with your neighbor, right? Like no, don't make a spectacle, don't make a scene. You no, know, take it inside, take it, you know. Take behind the garage door, you know, whatever the case may be and talk it out because you, you don't want to have a situation where, you know, you're taking your dumpster down to the curb and you see your neighbor. And you just give him that look like, yeah, yeah, I can't stand you, dog. I don't, I don't like you, dog. I don't like you. You, you want to squash those things because that stuff tends to leak into other things. If you got that community garden, you know, and you got an issue with your neighbor, that, that neighbor may skip his his turn to the community garden just because he don't want to do it with you. Or, you know, it may be their turn to, you know, do whatever. And, and so that really detracts from the, the you know, the uh, the overall quality of that neighborhood moving forward. So if you got any beef, you got any issues, squash it with the neighbor behind closed doors. 
Uh, and if you got to do a little fist of cuffs, just make sure nobody sees it, okay? <laughs> but I'm just joking, Startup Nation. Don't bring it to fist of cuffs. But what I am saying is squash your beef, squash your issues with your neighbors directly. Don't let it fester is basically what I'm saying. Also, you know, host a porch party. Like, if, you know, maybe you don't have a big porch and that's okay. But, you know, you know, let, let's just say you see somebody walking by like, hey, come over. Have a beer with me, wherever the case may be. Invite them over. Just be inviting, Startup Nation. That's basically what I'm saying. Another thing, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, uh, you know, make sure you shop locally at those businesses that's in your neighborhood. And make sure you hold those businesses accountable for the neighborhood. Look, uh, as an entrepreneur, if you're in a neighborhood, I feel that you're obligated to support that neighborhood because that neighborhood supports you. OK, I'm sorry. I just feel that way because those dollars, you know, you, you make money off that neighborhood. You should pour back into that neighborhood, into neighborhood schools, neighborhood charities, neighborhood community centers, neighborhood sports teams, wherever the case may be. So make sure you not only shop locally there, but also hold them accountable. And also, speaking of businesses and entrepreneurs, support the young entrepreneurs. You know, if you see some kids, they, they you know, got their lemonade stand up. Go, go buy a couple of cups of, of lemonade. OK, so because you want to once again, this is all about building camaraderie with your neighbors and with your neighborhood. So if you see some kids, they got the, they got the lemonade stand up with the cookies and everything. Go buy some cookies. Go buy some lemonade. That also builds camaraderie. Also, be willing to share your skills, Startup Nation. And this could go back and you could put that in that, that neighborhood directory that we talked about, right? Look, you never know who is in your neighborhood and what they may have. You may have a car breakdown. You know, Little do you know, four houses down the way is an ASC certified mechanic. Voila. There you go. Problem solved, right? Or maybe you're trying to get that resume fixed for you for that job that you're trying to apply for. And two houses down the other the opposite side is somebody who is a resume guru. Right. You just never know. It's one of those things where you're pooling your resources together because you never know what you may need. Like maybe somebody has you're outside and you're cutting your lawn and, and you're a first time homeowner and you don't know what the hell you're doing. Right. But you may have somebody who's been living in that neighborhood for 15 years. And when they first started, they didn't know how to cut their yard. And maybe they didn't have anybody to show them. But they got 15 years of experiences to your first month on the job as a homeowner, right? And so that person may be able to come over and they actually maybe help you to cut your yard. But what they're really doing is kind of showing you how to cut your yard. If you're one of those people who have been like an apartment dweller for so long, you know, know how to do that and i'm speaking from first time experience startup nation but what i am saying is that like you know share your skills pour pour back into the community share your skills other people share their skills and so that way you know you may even save a couple of dollars with certain services that you may need or you just may gain an extra skill that you can you know add and you know improve your own quality of life another thing startup nation is that like look you know when you talk to your neighbors and you find out you find out that hey maybe you know there there's a there's a little one on the way this that, and the other and then they tell you hey look i'm gonna be gone a couple of days my wife's giving birth this that, and the other you find that out make sure you do something nice for them when they come out, like we've seen people, you know, decorate the, the front part of somebody's house, you know, so when they get back home, they have like balloons and streamers and this, that, and the other waiting for them. That builds like this very tight knit community and sense of, you know, togetherness in that community. Because, like I said, everything I'm talking about, Startup Nation, when we talk about buying the block and we talk about next steps, these are some of the things we need to do in order to build a thriving community. And lastly, Startup Nation, make sure you connect online and offline with your neighbors look i'm not saying be facebook homies you ain't got to but at the very least like interact with one another it, it kind of helps with once again and i know i'm beating the dead horse building camaraderie because that's what you want to do start of nation so you know you have websites like next door you know where you can create online communities online as well where you can talk about some things hey maybe you got that beef with that neighbor and you want to squash it online. That's an excellent way to do it. So that way it don't come to behind closed garage doors, fisticuffs, or whatever the case may be. But everything I'm talking about, Startup Nation, is really about building camaraderie so that way you can scale a neighborhood moving forward. And building camaraderie with you know your neighbors, my friend Devin Marvin had this brilliant idea. He, he talks about, you know, well, well, let me go back. When you're talking about a neighborhood, this, that, and the other, one of the important things uh, you must do or you probably should do 
is to make sure your property value stays as high as possible, right? Because property value is extremely important to the homeowner. You know, when it comes to selling or getting equity, you know, home equity lines of credit, wherever the case may be. And so property value is super important. So my friend Devin came up with this idea of like this kind of consortium, you know, home improvement snake program. Let me explain. So what you do is, let's say you have like six homeowners, okay? And so what you do is you form this consortium or pact to work on a different home improvement project each month. So what you would do is everybody, you know, you come together, you have this meeting, uh, and then you say, this is what I would like to do my next homeowner project to be, right? So let's say somebody wants to put in a new deck, somebody wants to redo a porch or wherever the case may be, something that improves the value of the home. So what you do is you do, uh, you, you all put your, your home improvement idea on this Google Doc form, wherever the case may be. And then you set, you set a schedule on fixing up that home improvement project with all six homeowners. So homeowner one, let's say he wants to redo the porch. So all six homeowners will help him redo his porch. The next month, let's say the homeowner two wants to do uh, a new deck. And so all six homeowners come in and help him with that deck. And so you just keep going down the line until you get to homeowner six. Once homeowner six projects complete, you, you know, you, you redo, you know, you do the list over again, put up your next homeowner project up and then, you know, uh, and then you snake it, if you will, kind of like if you're familiar with fantasy football. So homeowner six this time will go first and then homeowner five, homeowner four, three, two, one and so forth or whatever, you know, order you want to go. The point is this. One, you're helping to build the property value of that neighborhood. Two, you're building camaraderie and co you know and cohesiveness and getting to know your neighbor as well. And so those are just some of the things that you want to do when building that you know type of camaraderie. So we're going to go ahead and take a quick break. I hope you're getting great value from today's episode. Once again, my name is Dominic Lawson and you're listening to The Startup Life. a teacher looking for great resources look no further than our teaching with owls section of our website enjoy great lessons such as our mini lesson for the story of an hour or dive into the nixon presidency as part of our legacy series enjoy great peace of mind from our units as they are common core line click the link in the show notes to purchase all right startup nation so let's continue so we talked about in the first segment about you know different type of ways to get into real estate right and then after that we talked about how we can build camaraderie amongst our neighbors right and the reason that camaraderie is so important is for this next segment that we're going to talk about which is kind of keeping crime low and deterring crime unfortunately when we talk about buying the block is usually in neighborhoods that you know let's just be honest they have like a high crime rate a lot of times or the crime rate is not ideal so in building the camaraderie you're now investing into each other's fate and so now you want to make sure that everybody's taken care of you want to make sure that crime you know is to a point where you can really scale and flourish the neighborhood so like i said the camaraderie is important in order for we can you know start to work together to deter crime in said neighborhood and so you know with all that being said we've already really talked about the first point when it comes to deterring crime knowing your neighbors, doing some of those things, those block parties and, you know, that that snake consortium home improvement model or whatever is really, you know, geared towards knowing your neighbors. So we don't need to beat that point anymore. The next thing you want to do is to form like a HOA or, you know, and or 
a neighborhood watch. These are great things to kind of create in order to, you know, help deter crime. For starters, when you have a HOA, you know, and you're pouring money into a pool to take care of improvements or take care of certain fees or take care of certain lawn care things or whatever the case may be, because certain HOAs have certain amenities to where you do that or whatever, right? Like you pay a fee and you get a newsletter or you have kind of governing body to hold everybody in check to keep property values high, wherever the case may be, right? In a neighborhood watch, kind of the same thing. You have somebody who set up checkpoints, who sets up, you know, uh, kind of like, you know, neighborhood night outs or whatever and meetings and stuff like that. So those are some of the things you also want to do as well when you're talking about deterring crime. Also, keep up your yard. Believe it or not, keeping up your yard is an excellent crime deterrent because people who keep up their yards, it, it, you know, to criminals for the most part, they, they it, it gives them a sense of like, OK, if the yard is, is, is kept up to par, then they're investing in a community. They're investing in a community nine times out of 10. They got a lot of money. So if they got a lot of money, nine times out of 10, if, if somebody calls the cops from this community, they're going to come really quick. So, you know, and so a criminal, you know, believe it or not, is going to think twice, even if it makes them think you know a little bit longer than normal. They're going to think twice to do something, some type of criminal activity in that neighborhood. And so, you know, you, you want to kind of uh, be mindful and, you know, not to have like, you know, things that don't belong in a front yard. Like, unfortunately, you have like couches and like other type of furniture that don't belong in a neighborhood, you know, in a front yard. Sorry about that. Or you have like a car that doesn't work in a front yard or something like that. You want to kind of deter away from that. Also, if there are vacant lots or abandoned parking lots that aren't used, you want to kind of keep those clean and keep those free of debris and wherever the case may be, because these all are crime deterrents, if you will, because it's kind of like the broken window theory, right? If you have like broken windows, nine times out of 10 is a rundown neighborhood. So nine times out of 10, you know, criminal activity can kind of flourish in those neighborhoods. So you want to kind of make sure you clean Keep the, the lawn mowed. Keep make sure it's nice and looking pristine, free of weeds. Is there any other plant trees, if you will? And just really make the exterior of the neighborhood look really nice. Also, you want to be cautious when you go out of town. Look, make sure when you go out of town, make, hey, look, hey, John, I'm going to be out of town for a few days. You know, make sure you keep an eye on the house, whatever the case may be. And, and if you feel... You know, comfortable with your neighbor, leave him the keys so he can turn on your 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 light when it's nighttime or the case may be right. Or if you got those automatic lights, if you will. So keep that in mind as well. Also, you uh, when it's nighttime, close your windows and blinds. No, look, no, nobody needs to see what goes on in there. Right. So if you got your, you know, things tend to illuminate at night. So if you got your big screen TV in there. It's going to look real nice to a criminal looking, peeking through that window, kind of casing the neighborhood, if you will. Also improve the lighting on your street. If there's a, a, a bulb in your street light that's out, make sure you call the city or, you know, whoever's in charge of that to make sure that they're, you know, that that's replaced as soon as possible because, I mean, I don't need to explain it, but, you know, uh, you know, a lot of light can deter crime. You know, a lot of light can make sure that, you know, it's a very affluent neighborhood, it's a well-watched neighborhood. And so, you know, you know, one of the advantages to crime is, you know, you can do stuff in the dark. So be mindful of that. Also, like I said, we talked about encouraging outdoor activity, block parties, porch parties, wherever the case may be. Also, get to know the local the police department. Take them something every once in a while. They'll be a little bit more invested in what you're doing, what you're trying to get in the community. Invite them to the block party. Invite them to the porch party. Invite them to the neighborhood from time to time so they can know what you're about, what you're trying to do, and this and the other. Also, install a security system. And if you don't, for some reason, you don't have the money for a security system, just, you know, get one of those. You can probably get them online. Just get one of them signs to put in your yard. Like I said, it, 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 it's an extra deterrent for a criminal if they know or think that you have a, a security system, if you will. They have uh, some that are expensive. They have something that are, are less sophisticated and inexpensive. So be mindful of that. Keep that in mind when you're talking about your neighborhood and deterring criminal activity. All right, Stop Nation. And so lastly, you know, so... Up until this point, we got our piece of real estate, right? And then we had our, our block parties and we've built our camaraderie in our neighborhood and everything's going well. We know each other. And now we, you know, we've got to a point where we kind of deterred crime in our neighborhood. We've been able to pull that off by building a cohesive unit, as my old baseball coach would say. We've been doing, being able to do this by building a cohesive unit of knowing each other. And now our neighborhood is primed and ready to scale. 
We're ready to take that next step and to, you know, the upper echelon in order to be a neighborhood that's respected, not only from a standpoint of a great place to live, but also a place where people have to take notice of it. And I'll kind of explain that a little bit later of what I'm talking about. So the thing is that makes great neighborhoods, you know, really great and awesome to live in stars, pride and ownership. Right. There is this this there's no greater feeling than having this piece of land that you've worked hard for and now you own it. And so you you have that same commonality now with your neighbors. And so they have pride in their ownership because their property values have going up because we've done all the steps that we talked about earlier in the episode. And so you really have. You know, not only pride and ownership, but now you have that low crime rate that we talked about. Right. And so in order to take that next step, we need to have some great schools in our neighborhood. And so we need to, you know, uh, like I said, not only invest in our schools and be supportive of our schools, but also be mindful of when new schools come into the neighborhood, whether it be charter schools, home schools. Uh, private schools, even public schools for that matter, right? So we need to go get to know our local school board district, our local school board member that takes, you know, that's responsible for our neighborhood or whatever, right? Get to know them, get to know what their psyche is and get to know how they feel about education. And also once that school goes into place, not only be supportive, but also hold them accountable. Because like I said, you know, and I know it sounds cliche, but the children really are our future. And so these kids, a lot of times, you know, they're not nec- they may not necessarily live in the neighborhood, but they're going to be attached to this neighborhood. So you want them to feel very prideful in this neighborhood. So you could be the one, you know, that that makes sure kids have, you know, not necessarily have like all their supplies and this and the other, but just go up to the school and, and, and you know, volunteer from time to time, read to the elementary kids, you know, be willing to police the halls when when classes change, when uh, if you're going to a high school or whatever. But you need to be mindful that a great school is all about is really part of a really great neighborhood. OK, go see the principal, go see the teachers, go meet the administration, get to know. You know, on a on a first name basis, because we all need to work together in order for this neighborhood to thrive. Also, great neighborhoods have access to medical care. Right. Talk to your city councilman, your your you know, if you have, you know, if you're in Shelby County, your county commissioner or whatever the case may be. Make sure you talk to them, have in their ear like, look, we need some type of medical facility in our neighborhood, because that once again, it's a hallmark or a pillar of a great community, because, look, people get sick. People hurt themselves. People need medical care. And even if it's a situation where you get, you know, you're able to lure a physician's office into the neighborhood, that's also important. You know, that's that that works fine as well. But eventually you want to have some type of access to medical care and dental care, of course, right? But you know, some type of access to medical care so that way, you know, people will know. Uh, that, you know, that is a great neighborhood. And like, if you move to that neighborhood, you can get access to health care uh, adequately. Also, believe it or not, let's say, you know, when you have a uh, power outages, one, one thing that, you know, that is great to be next to a hospital, or some, you know, some along those lines, uh, is that when there's a power outage, neighborhoods that are next to a hospital are usually the ones that are uh, able, you know, that will get their services restored first for obvious reasons. You have people, you know, you know, who may be on life support and they need machines in order to, uh, to keep body functions, you know, going or, you know, like I said, people get sick, emergency health, emergency rooms or whatever the case may be. So, like I said, usually if you're near uh, in a, live in a neighborhood that's next to a hospital or some type of medical facility like that, those neighborhoods usually have their power restored first for obvious reasons. That's that's one of those byproducts of having a medical facility in that neighborhood. But more importantly, it really is another hallmark, just like a great school, to have it a great neighborhood. Also, when we talk about hallmarks of neighborhoods, this and the other, and so your ownership and pride of ownership is going up. So, you know, you start to, you know, step up that rung of the uh, of the affluency ladder, uh, if you will. So another hallmark that I always say, besides a school, besides medical access, 
is a bank. You need some type of financial system in that neighborhood in order to help that neighborhood thrive because this goes you know, to help home improvement because you get home equity lines of credit. If you want to start a small business in that neighborhood, you know, you can go to the neighborhood bank or whatever the case may be or any other financial needs. That That is a pillar, a hallmark of a great neighborhood. Look, I get it. Like a lot of times we have, you know, we have an ATM machine in the neighborhood. We have some type of check cash in place that kind of serves in these under, you know, underutilized or uh, under bank neighborhoods, if you will, which when we talk about by the block, that's usually what you have in these type of neighborhoods. But we need to try to see if we can lure, talk to the county commissioner, talk to your city councilman or alderman or whatever the case may be about luring some type of banking, banking system, you know, whether it be Chase or Wells Fargo, whatever the case may be, even if it's like a local branch or a local credit union. Right. You no, know, we need to try to talk to that city councilman about trying to lure that bank into that neighborhood so we have a stable financial system in that neighborhood and a bank is very important to have that as well also an, uh, another hallmark of a great neighborhood is that they have close access to public transportation look not everybody wants to drive all the time i know i hate driving i'm not even gonna lie when i was 17 16 whatever the case may be that's all i ever wanted to do is drive and i swear two years later i was like i'm over driving but that's <laughs> That's another story for another day. But all great communities have access to uh, some type of transit authority or, tra or, or public transportation, whether that be subway, whether that be a bus, whether that be whatever the case may be. You need to be close to some type of public transportation. It's also a great hallmark uh, to a neighborhood. We may need to reroute, you know, bus line nine or bus line 11 to, in order to get through the heart of your neighborhood. Uh, in order for people to be able to get on the bus, because even though you may have an affluent neighborhood, there are some people, maybe you have kids in the neighborhood who don't have who don't have cars as well and they need to go to work. And I'm speaking from firsthand experience when I was 16, 17 years old. And so, like I said, a neighborhood that is uh, that, you know, that it thrives really does have great access to the transit authority or some type of public transportation in that neighborhood. Also, you know, you want to lure certain type of businesses in your neighborhood as well you know when it comes to nice restaurants and nightlife you know that that's also a drawing theme to having a great neighborhood one of the big ones one of the really big ones that you want to try to lure into your neighborhood a grocery store a grocery store is one of those consumer staples start of nation that you need to have in a great neighborhood because unfortunately like i said in the type of neighborhoods that we we're talking about where we talk about buying the block there are these things called food deserts where it's basically just a hole or this place where there's not a, a great deal of access to you know great healthy foods and vegetables or just food in general a lot of times unfortunately in these type of neighborhoods we have to refer we have to depend on the corner store or we have to depend on something that's not like a big time grocery store like your Kroger's or your Schnucks, Deerberg's or Safeways or whatever kind of grocery store chain you want to think of King Supers if you live out in Colorado wherever the case may be but these are the type of the things you need to have in a great neighborhood you have a great grocery store and we need to try to lure those type of businesses into that neighborhood. But also on top of that, you, you, you want to have outside of the consumer staple stuff. You want to have some nice stuff too. Like you want to have not necessarily a club, but something that speaks to great nightlife or something like a great restaurant, if you will, right? Like high end, you know, something above, you know, high end restaurants. Not necessarily have to be five star white tablecloth, you know, concierge type restaurants, but something that has a nice uh, you know, uh, ambiance, something that has a nice culture to it that really feeds and adds into your, your scaling and flourishing neighborhood. Cause at this point, your neighborhood is booming. Your neighborhood is the high spot is one is starting to show up on those CNN neighborhoods of America. This and the other list. And so that's kind of what you want to thrive to, uh, in order to, uh, you know, really scale your neighborhood. You know, things like a bakery is also something, the signs of a great neighborhood, because the thing is, if you're at a point where you have stuff like a bakery, that means all the, uh, well, look at it like this. Think of a neighborhood as if it's a person and a person that has like those Maslow hierarchy of needs where you have like the basic 
minimum uh, needs met. And then you get to the point where you're trying to get to self-actualization. So a neighborhood that says self-actualization would have something like a bakery. It's one of those things where it's not necessarily needed. But if you have something like a bakery, it means like you're at a point where you can do really awesome things. It's one of those things like I t say about cities or whatever, right? If your city has a like a sports team, that means your city is doing some well on the fundamentals, has a great stable government. It has a great stable community, has a great stable you know, uh, revenue, uh, ta generate tax revenue, whatever the case may be. Now you can pay for a sports team is one of those extra things where it's not necessarily you know, it's one of those extra things where it's not necessarily needed. But if you're getting to the point where you have a sports team, that means all your fundamentals are met. And you want to think about your neighborhood, your fl your flourishing neighborhood, like a little small city. Right. That's how you want to look at your neighborhood. You want to have things you know, like a thrift shop. Right. Like people love thrift shopping. OK, especially especially very rich people. And at this point, your neighborhood is flourishing so well, you're getting to that point. So you want to have a thrift shop uh, as well. Also, a car wash, a, a lawn care service, you know, because the thing is, once again, like we talked about earlier, if you have a if you have really great lawns, that's a that's a reoccurring theme to deterrent crime. But also people have HOAs or whatever. Right. And so the HOA is going to hold you accountable about having your how your lawn looks. Right. So you want to be mindful of that as well. Uh, you know, things like a sports bar. Uh, you want to have not just also grocery stores like, you know, you may want to bring in a Sprouts or a Fresh Market or a Whole Foods, you know, to really talk about scaling that community. It really speaks to a thriving community. Barbershops and hair salons, also another staple in that community. And the ice cream shops, once again, not needed, but it really speaks to a stable community. If you got an ice cream shop, that means you have a very stable community. Home improvement stores, your Lowe's and your Home Depot's really thrive in those really nice neighborhoods. They they thrive in neighborhoods where you have DIYers. And when, when we think about to the example I said earlier that my man Devin gave about the uh, the snake home consortium improvement model, you know, that can really speak to uh, something that you need. And so having a Home Depot and a Lowe's and even be able to get to a point where you can get like a a, a, a Lowe's card or Home Depot, Home Depot card, whatever the case may be, get in touch with the manager, make sure, you know, you get on a first name basis with him. Maybe he'll cut your deal from time to time to get those home improvement needs because he needs you to succeed. Uh, and so, you know, so whatever he can do to do that, he's going to do that or she's going to do that because I don't want to be sexist because women can manage a Home Depot or Lowe's as well. But, um, you know, a bookstore, once again, bookstores speak to a very nice neighborhood, it speaks to a neighborhood. Think about that example I gave earlier about that neighborhood library or whatever the case may be. You got a bookstore in your neighborhood, you're doing well. And then you want to have other things that, you know, speak to nightlife. Like I said earlier, like a bowling alley, movie theater, a whole bunch of different other things that really speaks to a thriving community in a thriving neighborhood. Massage therapists, you know, people, people get stressed at work. You may live in this really nice house in this really nice neighborhood with these really nice schools, access to health care, but people, they're still stressed. A massage therapy would be perfect, right? So you really have all this in this neighborhood, right? And so, you know, like I said, a lot of the stuff that, you know, that we businesses, we talk about, like, when you have those type of businesses, like those, what we like to call a consumer discretionary business or businesses that, you know, that, you know, you really can spend extra money on that really speaks to an affluent, thriving and flourishing neighborhood. And when we talk about buying the block, that's the point you want to get to Startup Nation. That's the point you want to get your neighborhood up to being because those type of things are in neighborhoods with high property values. They're, they're in things where you have a very engaged uh, you know, po political power, right? That's another thing. When you have this this flourishing community, you know, people in the you know in the the city council or the mayor's office, they're going to listen to what you have to say because you're a high. You, you, your neighborhood is generating tax revenue, right? Because these people care about their neighborhoods, they care about their yard, they care about their schools, and so you're you can hold political people accountable because you have this power. You have this powerful neighborhood that people are like. Okay, we have to listen to the people of this neighborhood because, you know, they're engaged, they're part of the process. So if we disenfranchise them, that's going to hurt us in the polls. And politics are always thinking about what plays politically well, right? So you want to think about that as well. And so these are just some of the ideas and, and what it ultimately looks like when we talk about a flourishing neighborhood from that, that little piece of real estate that you bought 
way down the road up until a point where you're a neighborhood to be reckoned with. So here's my final take. When we talk about buying the block, like I said, it's one of those things where you could just buy that piece of neighborhood, buy that piece of real estate and just flip it or rent it out. And that's fine. If that's something you want to do, that's fine. But think about the opportunity you have to do something a little bit bigger. We talk about, you know, you know, getting to know our our neighbors. Right. And they can you can work together with them to build that community. And you don't necessarily have to live there. Right. But you are an investor and a stakeholder in that community. Right. And so you can still do these things, you know, in that neighborhood, even if you live somewhere else. That's OK. That's truly OK. You're still adding. You're still investing in that neighborhood. OK. And then, you know, you want to get to you know, deterring crime because like, I'm sorry, crime is an issue and we need to, we need to figure that out. And so when you get to that point, you get, you get to know your neighbors and you get to, you know, to, to, you know, deterring that crime. Now we can really start to flourish that neighborhood and make it like the beacon of the city or of your County or, or cluster of in the neighborhood or wherever you want to think of it. Right. You really have an opportunity when you buy the block to create, create something that can stand the test of time. It's really the entrepreneurial mindset. It's just used in a totally different way. So when we think about buying the block and we think about some of the steps that we talked about in this episode, you don't necessarily have to take that, these steps that I said. If you figure out another way, that's fine. But the ultimate goal is to create this, this beacon, this place that people forgot about, but you turned it into not only a great neighborhood and a force to be reckoned with, but if you're a fan of Black Panther and you know what people in the black community have, you know, kind of dealt with over years and years and years, you can honestly have the ability to build your own Wakanda. So that's going to do it for this episode of The Startup Life. I really hope you enjoyed it. Uh, Like I said, I feel like if you take these steps to build this great flourishing neighborhood, you really can uh, show people that what buying a block is truly all about. If you want to let us know what you think about our show, have an idea for a show topic, or like to advertise on our show, send us a message on the Startup Life Podcast Facebook page. And while you're there, like and follow our page as well. It's a new way for us to engage with you, Startup Nation, and really grow our community. The link is here in the show notes. Subscribe to the show as it can now be heard on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher Radio, and SoundCloud. If you are listening on iTunes and you find our content valuable, please give us a five-star rating as it will help us climb the charts and help more people find our show. And hey, if you have an idea, be about that life, the startup life.